I do remember drunkenly going up to you at my wedding late in the night and saying, man, I hope Riley Leonard becomes something. <laughs> <laughs> at my own wedding. The dance floor was bumping. Drinks are flowing. And I do remember it was like, I don't know, 10, 10 30 p.m. or whatever. And you come over and you're like, I really hope Riley Leonard is going to be something. And I was like, brother, you just got married, man. Welcome to the opening bell of the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. I am Trevor Sikama. That is Connor Rogers. And welcome to the 2025 chapter of NFL Stock Exchange. Connor, I'm very excited, man. We have not heard from the people in a long, long time. Guys, it has been so long. I moved into a new place. As you can see by my plain S background, I'm working on it. <laughs> Calm down. I can already see the comments right now. Calm down. We're held hostage. <laughs> Basically. So Blink. I'm in, I'm if in Graham your- Mertz is not QB1. <laughs> He might not be far off, but we'll get into that in the episode. Look, I, I'm in a new house. Connor's got a new marriage. Not that he had an old marriage, but he's got a new yeah, marriage. He's got and a I, new wife. Look, I, I I know that for sure because I was there. I went. Hell yeah! You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't it wasn't a joke. It wasn't a facade. It wasn't just a tax write off. You know, I was actually there. I saw it. You sure? Um, I, you know, actually, they all could have been hired actors. You yes. know, I I, I don't know. Um, I don't really know how uh, how far that you would go to uh, deceive the the IRS. But anyways. Dude, you had the marriage, you had your honeymoon, we're all settled in now. We took a couple of weeks off, a little bit longer of an extended break than we normally do, but hopefully you guys can understand what the circumstances. Now we are back with a vengeance for summer scouting. We're doing it with the quarterback episode, kicking it off with a bang. Connor, before we get into it, my friend, how you doing, dude? How you been? Never been better. I am so happy to be back. I've thought about the recording of this episode for days. I and Because we've been watching the quarterbacks now for a while, so we, we knew this would be a big one, and... I think after watching the quarterbacks, it's bigger than I thought with the amount of varying opinions there will be on this group. And it's it's been a fun month. Uh, sure, like absolutely apologies to everybody that's been wondering where we've been. I totally get it. We don't – Trevor and I never take a month off from anything. So it was definitely <laughs> – it was probably a pretty long month. There was, you know, some quick business things that had to be settled, and that didn't take too long. I had to get married. I had to go on a honeymoon. It was awesome having you and Alyssa there. And now we're refreshed and back. And the thing with this is – it's not like we could have came back two weeks ago because we need to watch all these guys. This took a long time. That was the issue. It was like, man, I got a lot of homework to do as soon as I got home. Dude, normally when we do summer scouting and I feel like we're getting every every year we do this, I feel like we get a little bit more of a groove. But still, outside of wide receivers, when we, we can do summer scouting, like you and I will get, I don't know, six to eight guys yeah. in and we'll be like, all right, we've probably seen everybody we need to. I watched 15 quarterbacks. Right. Right. I, got, I got 15 quarterbacks ranked for this upcoming yep. class. And, you know, to build off of the conversations that people were having last year, you looked at a lot of the kind of desperation to move up and maybe some quarterbacks getting overdrafted in the 2024 draft. And a lot of people were like, well, these teams have done some future scouting and they see 2025 and it's not nearly as good at the top. It's not as star studded at the top, but damn, there's a lot of these guys. Like there's a lot of what if quarterback prospects in this class and you and I were talking a little bit before we hit record. We know the master list of players that each of us have watched. I have no idea what your rankings are. Absolutely no clue. So this is going to be fun for me to sit down and actually hear who you got as well. I was joking with you before we turned the mics back on and boy, were they dusty. I was like, <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm nervous for this one. Nervous. And because it could just, it could be so different, but that's, that's the fun of it. I think that's what makes this year it is so different from last year. That's all I kept thinking every time yeah. I finished writing up a guy was, wow, like last year it was it was very cut and dry. And yes, we had a huge surprise in Jade Daniels as a riser. That happens every year. That'll probably happen this year in some capacity, maybe not up to the second overall pick, but it's just it's just so different. I wrote down I for the top ten, I wouldn't call them tiers, but like notes for each group, like a one liner for each group to mm-hmm. put it in perspective. And it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a wild ride. That's all I could say. It's, but it feels good to be back. That's the most important thing. Dude, I'm so excited to dig into this. Um, you know, I, I was talking with the editing team over at PFF and we're trying to, you know, ramp up the draft coverage that we do anyways. We're trying to give you guys a lot more information as you're going to use the mock draft simulator, which by the way, 
we've turned it over to 2025. So if you guys, you know, are listening to these episodes throughout the summer and you want to get into some mock drafts, you can absolutely do so over at pff.com backslash draft. And what we want to do is, you know, when you click on those players, I actually want to have summer scouting blurbs on a lot of these guys and we'll have some recruiting background as well. And part of that is um, as I'm going through this this summer, I normally don't do this this early. I have some early player comps for a lot of these guys as well. So I'll mention those throughout the quarterback episode and kind of as we go through the summer and things like that. But I just wanted you guys to uh, look forward to that stuff. A lot of what at least some of the information I'll talk about will be on PFF.com as you guys use the mock draft simulator and all that good stuff. So because we watch so many quarterbacks, we decided to expand normally what we do. Typically for summer scouting, we give you our top fives. And we'll probably do that for most of the other positions. I don't know. Maybe we'll adopt this format as the main. But normally we do like the top fives. And we'll talk about some of the guys that just missed the top fives. We feel like to do the quarterback class justice going into the season. We're going to give you 10 through 6. Kind of talk about those guys. Maybe treetop some of the things that we like. And then really dig into five through one and kind of count down who we have as QB one individually going into the class. So Connor, you want to kick it off here, my friend? I know this is a, a, a it, this is an honor, but Big it's moment. also a pressure to hear which names are going to come out of your mouth here for 10 through six, but you can read them off to me and then you can kind of dig into whoever you want. I just can't stop thinking about since you said, cause I didn't know the mock draft machine has flipped over to 2025, how you can now log on and sell the farm for Grayson McCall. If you want to. <laughs> You can offer three ones and go up and get Dude, Grayson McCall. I didn't even watch Grayson. Yeah, I watched, he, I, I watched he was one 15, of the lightest ones I watched for me. 15 quarterbacks, and I still didn't get to. McCall is one that I still have to watch. Um, Dylan Gabriel is one that I still have to watch. But Same like, for me. Yep. I, 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 and no, and no. Kyron Jones is maybe the most notable one that I didn't get to. That's I a fake think. name. You Virginia Tech. You made that up. Yeah, I need that's to a, watch that's, a, that's a Madden creative player. I I don't I, I I'm I'm calling you on that one. College football twenty five. Oh, will we be bamboozled by a Madden skin? No, or, no, no, no. It's gonna be good. It's no. it's gonna be good. I, I saw will. our guy our guy Bengal because he's you know it's a pretty important person. He went down there and and got you know kind of got the inside scoop, a little demo, and he had a lot of positive thoughts, and I. I uh, I take his word. And I don't it. think they're paying Bengal. I really don't. And Bengal no. is also a man of the people. And he has been very critical of Madden as a lot of exactly. us. Exactly. That's why I take his words. Yeah. yeah. And so he's super excited about it. You know, I don't know if we'll be able to do it this summer, but uh, there might be an NFLSE dynasty league in the future. It'd with, be awesome. Uh, with college football. That would it be, would be awesome. So, okay, let's get into it. We got 10 through six. All right. 10 through six. Number 10 for me is Alabama's Jalen Milrow. <laughs> All right. Whoa, yeah. hot reaction out of the gate. No, I just number number 10. Like you, the, the reason why is because people have Milrow as like a number one overall. Potential, oh, yeah, right? I know. Right. I know. So, you know, you, you, you having him at 10 elicited that. Reaction. Yeah, every, the comment section already despises me. <laughs> I've been back for seven minutes and 50 seconds and they absolutely hate my guts. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <laughs> number nine, Donovan Smith on Houston. Okay. He's very interesting. Yep. Number eight, Noah Fafita okay. on Arizona. Yeah. He's wildly interesting yeah. for very, very obvious reasons. He's a he's a small fella, but he could throw the football. He is a small lad. But he Number is seven, player. Jackson Dart on Ole Miss, who mm-hmm. is a very popular name right now. And a guy I see that just hovers right around this range, I feel like, or will hover around this range. Number six, maybe the biggest surprise for people, and you have to dig deep because he didn't get a lot of a season last year, unfortunately, and uh, some of his injuries, unfortunately, are lingering into Notre Dame's spring ball, but it's Riley Leonard. For oh, me that's, not, that's not who I thought you were going to... Oh. oh, I kind of pulled the rug out from under you with the injury stuff. Yes. Oh, I know. I know who you're thinking of. Hold on, partner. Oh, hold okay. On, hold on, partner. Uh, God, I, I, I fast, do remember. Can I fast dr- forward the episode that we haven't even recorded yet, just to get to whatever you're teasing right there? I do remember drunkenly going up to you at my wedding late <laughs> in the night and saying, "Man, I hope Riley Leonard becomes something." <laughs> <laughs> at my own wedding, there were there were times, and that was like that was yeah, like we had the reception. Obviously, we had the cocktail hour, we had the entrances, everything. We were like eating dinner. The dance floor was bumping, whatever. Drinks are flowing. And I do remember it was like, I don't know, 10, 10, 30 p.m. or whatever. And you come over and you're like, 
uh, right. I, I really hope Riley Leonard is going to be something. And I was like, brother, you just got married, man. Like, I love you for no, it. I can't but- shake it. I can't quit it. Yeah. So Riley Leonard makes it to six. Okay. Um, so I'll read my one liners in, in the buckets for these guys. So I kept uh, 10 and nine Jalen Milrow and Donovan Smith in the same tier. And I wrote roller coasters with no emergency break. Uh, Noah Fafita had in his own tier. I just wrote, can he overcome historic size limitations? Yeah. I, I mean, they listed him 5'10", which if, so let's say he's 5'9 and a quarter. I, we'll get into his film because I know we are going to talk about him together. Yeah. I had Jackson Dart in his own tier. I, I just wrote, we might have something here, but he's still too inconsistent. It's a lot of highs and lows. And then Riley Leonard in his own tier too. I just wrote, is he healthy? And how will this new situation further his development? Because you watch the the glimpses in Duke's offense last year. It was bad. And a lot of that Duke's offense was, besides Graham Barton, nothing really looked very good. And he gets hurt. It's lingering. But in 2022, I, I thought Leonard had like pro flashes where I'm like, that's something you're going to do in the pros. He He's a really, really talented runner and athlete with an interesting athletic background. Um, but, I, you know, I kind of want to know your 10 to 6, I guess, before we cross conversate on a lot of these guys. Yeah, so I'll go 11 to 6 because I think that it's 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 topical because I have Riley Leonard at 11. So Leonard is 11 for me. Um, Noah Fafita is 10. Okay. Donovan Smith is 9. Okay. Jackson Dart is 8. Wow. Quinn Ewers is 7. Mm. And then Jalen Milrow is 6 for me. Okay, so we I'm actually surprised how many similar names we had in the bucket. I am too, because I want because you still have to say Ewer's name. Yes. And and I don't think he's gonna be outside of your top ten. So No, he's not. That means that I think I have someone within my top five that is not in your top ten. Possibly. I think um, so. I mean um, to put it in perspective, I saw like my three out and I, there, yeah, you said we said at the top, there's a couple guys we haven't watched, but a couple of my outside guys looking in, like Drew Aller didn't make my top 10, but he was I, right there. I have him 13. Right. Yeah. yeah. He didn't make my top 10. He's just not accurate enough, man. No, he's not. And man, at the end of the season, like he started to melt down against big opponents. And it, it when it got ugly, it got as ugly as it can get. So, so get so get this about Drew Aller, right? And I'll say a little bit about him because I know people love him. Former They're going to want to hear about him. That's why I brought him up. Former five star prospect. He's six foot five, two hundred forty pounds. It's 89th percentile and ninety third percentile for the position. I mean, he is a he, he's he was he was a five star quarterback in the twenty twenty two class. I mean, he was the number one quarterback in that year. He was the number three overall player. He was Ohio's Mister Football as a senior. Like he, this dude just truly looks like a future NFL quarterback. Yeah. The numbers don't really back it up. Now, Penn State's offense. Not the best. It's tough. It's tough, folks. It's tough. Um, but even with that being the case, his individual play still was not really – like it's still a long way to go for Drew Aller. I was looking up because in the process of – doing some more background information and recruiting information to give you guys when you click on the mock draft machine. I looked up some other sports a lot of these guys played. So probably to no one's surprise, he was a baseball player and he was a pitcher. And I remember reading in this article, Drew Aller himself said, as a pitcher growing up, I either struck batters out or I walked them. There was like no in between. And that's exactly how he plays quarterback right now. You're either getting a beautiful pass with NFL starting caliber zip and velocity right where it needs to go, or it's not where it needs. Like it, it's nowhere close to its target. It's it, he is way too that the way that he described how he was as a pitcher growing up to me is still how he plays quarterback. And he I just agree. he just was not accurate enough for me to put him above some of these guys, even in a. Uh, less tre- less top tier and more like deep quarterback class he still was 13 for me that's how i felt i'm one of my lines that i pull out from my sheet was he gets caught aiming rather than throwing at times and he just completely loses control it's mm-hmm. it's like it's almost bizarre where he's really so locked in and, and doesn't have control of the ball and it's just trying to aim it and it's uh it doesn't look pretty but he's a really young player I think he did some good things. I want to see how he can develop this year and find his way into this group. Should we talk about 
Nilro out of the gate because he's maybe the most interesting player on the entire show. Sure. If we so want to be honest. Yeah. So you got him at nine and I got him at six. And I think I like, had him at 10. I had him at 10. I had Donovan Smith at nine right ahead oh, of him. Okay. But I had them in right. the same bucket, like very, very similar tier to me. I'm trying. What, what are the odds to go number one overall right now? Because Milro is, I guess he's not. I mean, he's not high. He's plus 3,500. Okay, he's lower than I thought that he was going to be. Drew Aller's plus 1,900? There is some buzz for Aller as a round one prospect and some. Cam yeah. Ward's plus 1,700? The number one overall in the draft. Yes. Are there odds to just it not be a quarterback? Because I'd literally sell the house I just bought and put all the money on that. Cam Ward has the fifth highest odds according to FanDuel right now. To go number one overall. Dude, I have Cam Ward ranked 12th. Do you? Okay, that's going to be fun because I have Cam Ward 5th. Whoa! Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll get there, though. So I have two players in my top five that I don't think you have. Yeah, top five is going to be really interesting. Ooh. Okay, let's yeah, let's talk about Milrow. What do you think about Milrow? Man, he has some of the best throws in this entire draft class on tape. Uh, I mean, I really, really mean it. Big time arm strength, easy velocity, mobility that makes him such a dangerous scrambler that when the play breaks down with that arm and the scrambling, he can push the ball vertical off the scramble. I didn't see that with a ton of guys in this group. He is a very fearless player, and that leads to, like I said at the top, some of the best throws you will see in this entire quarterback class. And I like the clutch factor. I mean, he made clutch plays against Auburn and Georgia. Mm -hmm. the, the speed is straight line explosive speed. Where it becomes problematic, Trevor, I mean, this is a guy that had double-digit fumbles in 2023. Yeah. He, he took 44 sacks on 384 dropbacks. Yeah. He has no idea where the blitz is coming from. Like, if it's a blitz or not a blitz, it just seems like it's the same thing to him every time. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he had great feel for pressure. I thought he loses accuracy and touch when he doesn't follow through on his throws and keep his base in sync. He falls yep. into this habit of like, it's just all arm yep. because he's gifted. He's one of the most gifted quarterbacks in college football as Truly. an athlete, as a thrower, as an actual quarterback. And we have seen guys that are very physically gifted. Think of Drake May last year. They are so physically gifted that they can get away with certain things and create bad habits at times. The timing and the route communication with his wide receivers will drive you crazy if you just watch full games in a row. Like, there's times with Jermaine Burton where Jermaine Burton's looking at him like, dude, what? Like, no. so that stood out to me. Um, the ball placement on intermediate passes, like, he, he doesn't see defenders that kind of flood the field. He had seven turnover worthy plays in the 10 to 19 yard range and only 65 attempts. So there wasn't a ton of these intermediate attempts, but there's a lot of turnover worthy plays. He just needs to understand when it's okay to check it down. Like if they're showing he, you, he, heavy, is, he, 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 he will not check the ball down, right? Dude, now. it's which is such a simple thing yeah. when they're showing you heavy pressure and he needs to start seeing that. Just understand your running back's going to be wide open in the flat and let him do the work. Right. This, uh, this guy is really gifted. I am. I, I'm not going to say this about a lot of players on this show today. He can genuinely play himself into being a first round player. But if I was giving a preseason grade, and I don't have a first round grade on any quarterback we talk about today coming no, into the I preseason. No, I don't either. Not a either. single one. So I think yeah. that kind of gives people a lot of uh, you know clarity. But like if the draft was today for Jalen Milrow, he's a fourth round developmental guy. So he the pendulum can swing so far in two different directions for this guy. He, it, you mentioned he's he's so gifted, and Milro is very difficult to understand. Like, where do I place him? And the highs alone that I saw from him last year led me to having him at number six because I, I was in between having him again, like at six or nine or ten, and it's just there. I mean, there's there's reasons to have him basically anywhere in the top ten, but Milro's got some nuts numbers and. What was, he had by far the highest big time throw percentage of any of the fifteen quarterbacks that I won. right. It's by crazy. Far. He the, he. I think his big time throw percentage is like nine point five and a half. It's and there's stupid. a lot of guys below five to put it, it in context. Dude, it's stupid. And if and another, here's another here. So people like to talk about like quarterback criteria. Um, like when I was on Move the Sticks, Daniel Jeremiah's podcast. Uh, one of the things that him and Bucky asked me was. 
hey, like, what are your quarterback criteria? Like, what, do you look at certain situations? Because they know that we have PFF Ultimate. We can kind of like categorize like how they play in certain situations. And one of the categories that I like to put quarterbacks in is let me see you on third and long. Third and seven plus, right? Like, what kind of a quarterback are you? Out of the 15 quarterbacks that we watched, Jalen Milrow had the second highest grade on third and long. The only one who had a higher grade was Noah Fafita. And Fafita had a 2% big-time throw percentage on third and long. Jalen Milrow had a 167 like what? What, dude? He is gonna throw that thing. The dude. Hi- the highs of of Milro, not just as a runner, but as a passer, yeah. are wild. But you mentioned it. I mean, he does not see secondary defenders. I mean, he will see primary defenders. He will go, okay, this player is guarding my wide receiver. I need to see what they're doing. But if they are moving, especially cross field, and there is a safety that could come down, or there oh. is a linebacker that can drop. He does not see the secondary defenders nearly as much as he needs to. Um, you mentioned does not really see the blitz as, as well as he needs to. Does not throw the way throw away the ball to kind of live to fight another down. And his his average time to throw is three point four five. <laughs> Will not fly at the NFL level. I mean, no. it, it barely that's longer than Justin Fields. That's longer than Caleb Williams. Right. Like it's just it, it's got to get on a down by down basis. It's got to get so much quicker for him. Um, even with the athletic ability that he has. So just some of those highs that I mentioned there, I mean, they're, they're, they're nuts. The third and long stuff is, is, is absolutely nuts. Um, but then, yeah, you look at some of the negatives, his, his avoiding negatives percentage, because we, we like to use that as a stable metric, because if you continually avoid negatives in college, you will generally that translates to the NFL level. If you turn the ball over a lot in college, you're probably going to continue to do it at the NFL level. If you don't turn the ball over a lot in college, you'll pr- – I mean, the NFL is more difficult, so there's always a little variance there, but chances are that's kind of how you play, and you will be somebody who takes care of the football. Jalen Milrow was 10th percentile in avoiding negatives, 0th percentile in sacks taken. Zero. Like it's just both of those categories have to get way better, way for better him. before he's a prospect. Yes. Honestly, like I know that's harsh to say, but before he's a real NFL prospect, those things have to prove. I got him as a mid round guy just because of the floor, the like, traits. You, you, yeah, he has he traits. Just, he, he's he's yeah. Anyways, so all right, who do you want to talk about? You want to talk about Fafita next? Where do you have Fafita? I, I had Fafita, I think at eight. Hold on, let me double check that. Yeah, I had Fafita at eight, right after the tier of Milrow and Donovan Smith. So I have him at ten. Um, you want to talk about him or you want me to talk about it? Take it. I, I went long on Milrow, so I, I want your thoughts on Fafita, who's, I think, a very, very good college quarterback. And we just don't know if if he can be an NFL quarterback. If, if Noel Fafita was 6'2", 215. First rounder. I mean, he might be. He's, he's QB1. Like, uh, yeah. like, he's probably QB1 in this class. Yeah. So Fafita's just a redshirt sophomore. Um, they got, like you mentioned, they got him listed at five foot ten and a half. 195 pounds he's going to be bryce young sized right and he's and he's he's not going to have bryce young's success level versus sec competition he's probably not going to have a heisman trophy behind him you know so it's like when you take all those things away now all of a sudden you're really looking at a lot of deficiencies that he has so he's a former three-star quarterback he's Um, rooting he's rooting harder for bryce young and bryce young's family yeah i mean truly yes like every sunday he is putting on his panthers bryce young jersey and saying all right it's go time or else i'm i'm in trouble he is he he's got everything like he's ordered he's putting on his shoulder pads a bryce young game worn panthers jersey panthers like him like game worn pants the helmet like he's putting on the helmet like because if bryce young takes a leap this next year fafita's stock automatically like at the NFL will give him a chance right they will get they will give him a chance so he's a really fun quarterback man i i'm I'm afraid that he's just gonna be you know a a great college quarterback but god he's so smart avoiding negatives 96th percentile Time to throw, 2.55. I mean, the ball's coming out of his hands very quickly. Adjusted completion percentage is almost at 80%. Now, he's got a really low average depth to target, really low big-time throw percentage, which unfortunately kind of goes into the stature, um, his overall arm strength. But his, his timing, 
He's got good pace on passes within 35 yards. Now, I, I know you got to throw it past 35 yards, but just to kind of list off the strengths, I mean, the, the the pace, the zip within 35 yards is actually pretty good. The timing, how he reads defenses, he can manipulate guys with his eyes. He plays the quarterback position very, very well. I like the footwork. I like the follow through. He's got the... He's got the leg kick. You know, he's kicking out the leg just to put more of his body into it. But it bothered me. It is, and it should because you have to take note yeah. of that because he's a smaller player. But I will say this. I like Fafita's fundamentals more than I like Jordan Travis's, you know? That's fair. I, I was more comfortable watching Fafita's film than I was Jordan Travis's because Travis, I felt, just was putting everything in his body into yeah. basically like every throw. And I didn't quite think that Fafita had to do that, but he also didn't really push the ball too far. But – Look, like like we said, small size guy, but really smart, great processor, sees the field very well, understands defenses, knows how to recognize things pre-snap already, despite being just a redshirt sophomore. I saw that get better from the beginning of his film in 2023 to the end. He was able to recognize those things a little bit better, even though they need to continue to grow. I think he's a really good prospect. I, or I, sorry, I think he's a really good college football quarterback. I just don't know if he'll be he'll ever be seen as a good prospect because of the size deficiencies that he has yeah and there's a good chance that he might not be in this draft class because you know if he did enter he'd, he'd be 21 on draft day so he's a young player maybe you can he could be that kind of guy that just says hey i'm going to kind of build my body like rusted where yeah i'm going to be short but i'm going to be really thick and i'm going to be able to take hits and he's really gutsy you don't have to doubt that the- i um the comp that i had for him not perfect, but I have Vernon Adams. For oh, the, I thought the, of Vernon Adams while early, watching him. The early comp for him. Yeah, I thought of Vernon Adams while watching him because I yeah. was like, oh, this is good. This could be like you remember it. Vernon Adams had some real support from the mm-hmm. draft Twitter community. Mm-hmm. And I think there's going to be a section of draft Twitter that really likes Fafita. Um, I don't know if the NFL ultimately will. Right. I'm with so, you. But yeah, you nailed it. Uh, you want to... Well, we got to talk about Riley Leonard, probably, although there's really not a lot to say. I kind of went over it, like didn't have a season for much of last year. Duke's offense looked dreadful when he was out there. He had an ankle injury, and now he has a lower body injury that's lingered into the spring, which is concerning to me. Is it still his ankle? I think it's I don't think it is. Mm. I think there was complications from the ankle that he had cleaned up. There's a lot going on there. Leonard is very, very talented. And this is a good place for him to really restart his college career. And he has NFL traits, size, speed, throws. But he needs to be on the field and he needs to really put polish in his game uh, for all of that to kind of come to fruition. So six foot four, 215 pounds. You mentioned he went through a lot of injuries last year, which really hampered things. I mean, he's a former three-star quarterback coming out of high school, but he's also a two-sport athlete. Um, he actually almost pursued basketball instead of football dad a uh, really good basketball player for the citadel yes dad played at the citadel um his uncle played at georgetown That's i looked right. that up as well uh great granddad actually played for notre dame back in the 40s uh now riley leonard transferred from duke to notre dame so that's pretty cool yep. um big track background does he riley have a track leonard? background I didn't oh see yeah that. big jumper oh triple, that yep. makes total sense yep. triple jump long jump high jump 300 yeah. meter, meter hurdles and very very you know, successful and with it. Mobility is a big is a big part of his game. Mobility and escapability, um, running the RPO offense, being able to um, have quarterback design runs that they're able to run with a lot of success. The problem is the accuracy and ball placement for him is just not there. And if you watch, like, if you go through the exercise of give me Riley Leonard's best five throws, might be a first rounder, right? I mean, like he he has some awesome touch passes but they're just so few and far between from the mistakes and the head scratchers and just not getting the ball where it needs to the pocket management i also thought was not where it needed to be with him um i i thought when it came to really pushing the ball deep down the field with distance i was kind of that was a little bit lacking for me the more that i watched compared to nfl levels but you just look at some of his numbers adjusted completion percentage and this is adjusted completion percentage barely into the 70s it's 70.2 percent that time to throw for ryan leonard almost three seconds it's 2.95 avoiding negatives ninth percentile that's lower than Jalen milrose was yeah 
you know, the sacks aren't nearly as bad. You know, sack rate was was 4.5, the 64th percentile. So it's not like he's taking a ton of unnecessary sacks, but like it, it's just he's putting the ball in harm's way way too much. He wasn't seeing the field the way that he needed to. Notre Dame's got to be his best year yet of of just overall like seeing the field the way he needs. The early the early player comp that I have for him is Jeff Driscoll. You remember Driscoll? Oh, I remember Dr- Driscoll. Driscoll had a lot of tools, a lot of talent. He was that dual threat type of a player. He just could not get that consistency down to ever really be a legitimate starting NFL quarterback. And I think he's still a backup. If is I he hanging correctly. around as a tight end or no? Oh, did he switch over? I know. I thought he got looks at tight end at some point. Let's see. Uh, he's a quarterback, he's, he's quarterback right for now. the commanders. So hmm, I guess that was just in my brain. Maybe he should be I, I, a tight you end. Know, you, know. you know what? To Driscoll's credit, it's what hung around the NFL for eight years now. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, that's, he, a, yeah. that's a long time in the NFL. He got for, drafted in the sixth round in 2016 and he's still there. So, but that's the thing. Like when you have size, strength, speed, when you have those tools, I mean, some teams basically always going to give you a backup job. So yes. it's just what is is Riley Leonard going to be more than that? That's kind of I, I saw some shades of Jeff Driscoll there from him. Can we talk about Donovan Smith? Hell yeah! Where'd you have him? Uh, I had him ninth. I also had him ninth. Mm. What a wild ride Donovan Smith's tape is. 6'4", 237. I know some sites have him as 6'5", 241. You get it. He's a big quarterback. Mm -hmm. He is very physically gifted, Trevor. Mm -hmm. Dad is the Colts running backs coach, by the way. Yep. Uh, Best blurb on a school website that I read throughout this period was his. His motivation for working hard, the haters. (laughs) No way. I swear to God, you can go on Houston's website and, and read it. Oh. Oh man, I, just, I, I love. Up. He's he's in my top five. Actually, I no. really almost bumped him up a couple spots. He's actually in my that. top five. I, he, was, I was wrong. 2023, 2,801 passing yards, 22 passing touchdowns, 13 picks, 22 big time throws, and 16 turnover worthy plays. He also had over 600 rushing yards, six rushing touchdowns, 41 first downs. Yeah, three star recruit. He played wide receiver for very uh, noteworthy high school program. Bishop Gorman. Heard of it. In Vegas, then he transferred his senior year to play quarterback uh, in Texas, and you know, obviously wanted to be a quarterback. Had that chance, started out at Texas Tech. Now he's at Houston. Listen, this dude's a big-bodied quarterback that can rip throws in any area of the field. He could drive the ball in between zone coverage. Mm-hmm. He does not need a lot of space to generate power in his throws. No, and he's a yeah. Big bodied power runner that I thought was particularly effective on third and short and at the goal line. And that's that really kept a lot of drives going for them. And he doesn't care about getting hit, doesn't care about moving the pile forward. The weakness is there are too many interceptions, Trevor. You just have no idea what he was doing. Like you look at it and you're like, wow, you really tried to throw that ball into triple coverage, or you ran around for eight seconds and just said, fuck it, I'm throwing this up there. (laughs) And, and I respect it. I really, really do. But man, it's crazy. And my when we get to Cam Ward, I'm gonna have a similar rant. But yeah, you just, got him in five. I know <laughs> that speaks to this quarterback class, by the way. So uh, here's a weird one. When you you know, I know you're a numbers guy. You work for PFF. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> I, I am on a PFF podcast. It, did you find this weird? 10 plus yard throws to his left were a significant problem. He was 10 for 22 in the 10 to 19 yard range. He was two for 14 in the 20 plus yard range to his left. Two touchdowns, four picks in those ranges. And I bring those up because he could throw the absolute heck out of the football down the field. His numbers throwing to the right are really, really good. He is a good, talented, deep ball thrower. He has all the arm strength in the world. He was not accurate throwing to his left. It was really puzzling. Now I got it. Now I got to go back to watch his film because I didn't necessarily see in anything in his fundamentals that would have told me 
that he no. would have had deficiencies throwing to his left. Like sometimes guys, you can tell they're like you're they're like overextending in their follow through, and they'll hold on to it a little too yeah. long, and so the ball will sometimes veer more towards the left. Where you know if you're throwing to the right side of things, and that's the case normally, you can still keep it in bounds, but that could mean some turnover worthy plays. And if you're throwing to the left, and that's the case, you'll throw it out of bounds, but you still won't get the the, the completions there. Sometimes like. Your hips can be a little bit wider. Your feet can be pointed in the wrong direction. You open up a little differently. Right. Yeah. But, you know, there are guys who sometimes it's tough to be overly critical. And I, I try not to be on total throwing motion, you know, feet all the way through your follow through. If it works for you, it works for you. But there are some times when if you got accuracy issues and you don't necessarily have your fundamentals down, I'll point that out in your film. I didn't really see that with Smith. So that's very interesting that he struggled so much to his left. Yeah, huh. and, and you know when he was pressured, just a scary drop off in accuracy in yards per attempt. It was he his, really he really struggled like, under pressure. His clean pocket passing grade is eighty four point seven, and his pocket his pocket grade under pressure is thirty eight point seven. I mean, two totally different players, totally different players. Uh, you know the issue for me with Smith, and I can understand why some people are going to be higher on him because of like what you mentioned, a uh, really good dual threat ability. He's got a lot of potential to him there as a runner and a passer. Like a lot of that stuff is there. And let's be honest too. He he only he was a part-time starter in 2021 and 2022 with Texas Tech. He only started four games in each of those in each of those seasons. So this past year with Houston was the first year where he was a full-time starter. He 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 sees things a tick late right now. Yeah. He to me, I'm watching him play, and there were a handful of plays where I went back and I just would rewind it like six or seven or eight times. And I'm like, you, you, you've got to be able to see that this receiver was going to be open before you started your throwing motion. See it open versus throw it open. He, he, he is way too much right now waiting for these wide receivers to be open. And I think that actually lends itself to a little bit of overcorrection of what you talked about earlier, where it's like, how are you trying to complete those throws? It's because he he doesn't have that sense of throwing to a spot that I know is confidently going to be open right now. And I think because of that, the two detractors are he's late when he does see it right. And when he sees it wrong, sometimes he'll pull the trigger anyways. So that's where I'm at with Donovan Smith as a really toolsy quarterback, but somebody who is not seeing open space and trusting to throw to a spot rather than waiting for a guy to be open and kind of pulling the trigger after that. Totally. I'm with you. The last guy we didn't talk about was Jackson Dart, right? Yeah. Um, I think Jackson Dart is a, a really nice prospect. I'm, I'm really curious to see how he develops. Me too. Well, former four-star quarterback, somebody who uh, was a Gatorade football player of the year, um, also was an All-State baseball player as a third baseman. So, like, he's got positional versatility to him. He was he was at USC before he transferred to Ole Miss, and he, he w- wanted to play for USC, and then I think it was, what was it, Clay Helton. So the coach got fired, and then Lincoln Riley came in, and when Lincoln was like, yeah, I'm bringing Caleb Williams in, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to transfer now. So he transfers over to Ole Miss, there's some things to like about him. I, in his strengths category, I got natural poise in both in and out of structure. Right. I think, I think he's he is a very natural athlete. Feeder light, balance, ready to take off or brace for a throw very quickly. Willingness to step up in the pocket. Above average mobility and escapability. And I think he's got a decent arm. I think he's got an adequate or average arm for the NFL level. The big issues for me with Jackson Dart is, and I don't know if this gets remedied this year, in Lincoln or sorry, in Lane Kiffin's offense, it's very streamlined. It is, we are scheming things up yeah. for this player to be open. And he throws at that player a lot when he should and when he shouldn't. I agree. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's really tough as an eval when you have a player who comes from that system that is very read-friendly because you're not really going through progressions. You're not really reading the whole field of the defense. Sure, your numbers might be efficient, but like, when that pressure comes at you at the NFL level, when these defenders are a lot better at the NFL level, when you cannot just lock in on one primary guy, what are you as a quarterback? And I, I don't know how well of an answer we're going to get that from Jackson Dart this year because I saw way too much of it of him just being locked into the, to the Lane Kiffin system. 
I think it's really well said by you. I think he took me the longest to watch out of any quarterback because of the because of the system. I really tried digging around like you watch games. And then I was like, this is one of the rare times I'm going to have to go to some cut ups of unique things. I started playing with a lot of filters because I just need to see him in situations that are outside of the comfort zone of the offense. And I'm with you. I like the arm. He has no fear of getting rocked. He hangs in there and makes a throw, but he also takes some really bad sacks. Uh, sometimes he'll stare too long, like you said, locking in. He, he kind of pats, yeah. pats the ball. It allows guys in zone to make a break. So I think he's 20, somebody that can really take a big step this year, but there's there's some key things there to watch. Yeah, 28th percent, just 28th percentile, which, by the way, guys, when we're talking about percentiles, you want to be much higher, right? right. Let me, you want to be a lot closer to 100 than yard zero. 28th percentile in sacks taken in a 2.75 time to throw average for an offense that's normally pretty quick at getting the ball out of your hands. So um, he just needs to continue to, to improve when it comes to how he sees the field, maybe getting through progressions a little bit quicker and all that stuff. So uh, I think that was it. I mean, Ewers is in my... Yeah, we'll get to Quinn. Yeah, Ewers is seven for me. I think we've talked about pretty much everybody else. We'll talk to, We'll talk about Cam Ward and we'll talk about some other guys. So uh, who you got a five? Five is Cam Ward. And... Listen, I get it. Like, this is the guy that I wrote down. People could have him, like you, outside the top 10. I'm not really shocked. There will be people that will tell you that Cam Ward can rise up and be a top three quarterback in this draft class. The and comments for Cam Ward? Cam Ward has a stronger army than the Attics. I'm serious. True. We, we might lose. Well, thankfully, you have him at five, because I was going to say, we might have lost him if it was just my ranking. This, the subscriber count might have gone down by 10,000 if, if we would have just gone by my ranking. People love Cam Ward. And let me say this. Cam Ward is an awesome player to root for when you realize that like he had to start out in the FCS. And he won the Jerry Rice Award in 2021 for being the most outstanding freshman in the FCS. And then he goes and finds success at Washington State. Chaotic success, but success. And now he's at Miami. And... We're going to see contemplated the draft last year. He did. And I'm glad he didn't go. I am. I don't think he would have been a, I don't think he would have been taken in the first four rounds. If he declared, I don't know if he would have been taken in the first five. Yeah. Here's the thing with Cam Ward. Big year. Statistically, no surprise in the pack. Washington state. He throws for over 3,700 passing yards, 25 passing touchdowns, only seven picks, 24 big time throws, only seven picks, but 21 turnover worthy plays. (sighs) Cam yes. Ward, he's a wild man. Like, it is truly crazy watching him play football in yeah. both the best and both the worst ways. I put him in as, uh, no, I, I have him kind of in a tier with the next guy, but they're so different. So I'll have to kind of workshop that. Here's the thing dangerous athleticism to elude pressure and activate the scramble trail. Like, the, the cuts, the shoulder dip, the agility. He is very difficult to get a hand on. He shows pretty touch on the deep ball for these bucket tosses over the defense that just fall into the lap of the receiver where you're like, how the hell did he do that? And he has the Jaden Daniels zero fear as a runner to move the chains. Like, I'm going to get rocked like a pinball, and I do not care. The problem is with Cam Ward, there's no way around it. 21 turnover-worthy plays is a very concerning number, factoring both the INTs, the six fumbles, and the should-be INTs. He simply, Trevor, and you said this earlier about someone else, he simply will not let a play die to live for the next one. He mm-hmm. won't. He Every play is, is backyard football. We're getting a touchdown. It's such a chaotic brand of football, and he's a bit of a fumbling machine. But he is really, really talented. He's a gamer. He's a really unique athlete in terms of the mobility at the position that if somebody in this Miami offense just gets through to him and say like, man, you dial things back a notch or two where we cut out some of these chaotic fumbles and these throws that you just don't need to try because you don't need to score 60 points a game. I mean, I, I see Cam Ward as a guy that can really come into the NFL as an interesting developmental backup. And I want to be clear. I think that really speaks to this class that my QB five, my summary evaluation is like interesting developmental backup. If he was in the draft today, there's just mm-hmm. no way around it. Mm-hmm. This class is very different from last year. And we're going to yeah. get to some more interesting guys, I think in my top four, but we just have to be honest with ourselves. It's just so different than last year. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. And and, and I, I think that this again, really good to reiterate kind of as we get into the top fives here. Um, 
just some added context to kind of like where he came from, just some stuff that I, I looked up and I found out. Almost quit football in high school because his coaches kept putting him on JV until his junior year. Um, Is he just so, too small? So, uh, well, so the, the, the offense that he ran was a wing T offense. So, I mean, he, he only had 233 passing attempts in his entire high school career. Wow. So, like, that's why he was a zero-star quarterback. So he goes to Incarnate Word. You mentioned he wins the Jerry Rice yeah. Award for being the top FCS player. He goes to Washington State, puts up some really good numbers there. But he is just he, he is truly a, a unique individual, a unicorn, uh, just a, a, a very interesting case study of how to play the quarterback position because there's a lot of stuff that he does that is, I would say, unorthodox. And yet there are some of it where you go, okay, that worked, <laughs> I guess. So, and he's just kind of a wild ride. I, it starts with the sidearm release. You know, some of these guys, um, like Riley Leonard does this, you know, Quinn Ewers does this. Yeah, he does, yeah. Like, you will see them at at times give you that, like, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers type of, like, ooh, let me give you, like, a a nice little sidearm release. Cam Ward's every down throw is, like, out here. Like, it's it's totally a sidearm release. I had to go back and watch some film of guys because as I was coming up with a player comp, I was like, who has this type of emotion? Bernie Kosar kind of wow. had that time of kind of emotion, but I'll tell you, the one that he actually looks the closest to is David Carr. Whoa. David, David Carr actually had that sidearm release almost very similar to the way that Cam Ward releases the football. So that was kind of the comp that I came up with there because, you know, Carr had a little bit of elusiveness to him as well. And I think that that's actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good comp there. Now I don't, I don't think Cam Ward's going to go number one overall. Like, uh, like, da- wait, did I say Derek Carr or David Carr? Which one did I say? I think you, I thought you said David. In this yeah, show. so yeah, Dave, David, yeah. David, David's the one. David's the one that I meant to say. I'm just making sure. I thought so. Yeah. So David goes number one overall. I don't think Cam Ward's going to go number one overall, but stylistically, those guys were very similar in my opinion. Uh, my little scouting blurb that I have on him, and remember, he's QB twelve for me. Ward is a classic college football fan favorite. He is so tough to bring down in the backfield and is always looking for the big play. His arm is adequate for the pros in strength, and he has some impressive touch throws. But his throwing fundamentals with the wild sidearm release and true ball placement are far too unpredictable on a play-by-play basis. He also must hold on to the ball better with way too many fumbles right now. Yeah, slippery hands. Uh, You know, you look at his time to throw, and it's it's 2.80. It's a little on the high side. Um he has sacks taken 14th percentile again. Like that's not great. This is a very interesting stat that I saw here. So on third and long, not only do I look at adjusted completion percentage, grades, big time throws, turnover worthy plays, things like that. I also look at past the sticks percentage because I want to know, are you getting this first down with your arm? Right. Or are you primarily asking your playmakers to do it? Wards, I thought, would have been much higher. And he had one of the lower past the sticks numbers at 29.5%. Normally, you get guys who are like 40, 50, sometimes 60. His being in the high 20s was very shocking to me, but it kind of goes to lower average depth of target. And you mentioned his big time throws were 24, his turnover worthy plays were 21. And you just don't want it to be that even. It, you just it can't be that even. And they're both high. Like he's making big <laughs> right. throws, and he's also making big turnover worthy plays. Right, right. He's just he's a uh, like I said, a an unorthodox player in a lot of ways. You've got to have a lot of success as an unorthodox player for me to really buy into you. And um, I just don't think that I saw enough of it in the ways that I wanted to with Cam Ward. Who's five for you? Uh, who is five for me? Um, oh. Did you watch Jalen Daniels from Kansas? Uh, no, actually. I watched him last year because he was eligible. Jalen Daniels is five for me. Wow. Yeah. Jalen is fun, man. Okay. He is. I, uh, I This might come bite me in the ass, but I don't well, care, man. I'm really curious now because I, I didn't think of him as a priority watch from what I'd seen last year, but I will absolutely watch him right after this. So so Jalen, six, six feet tall, 220 he, pounds. So yeah, obviously he's like dense. The height, smaller, but he's a dense dude. Unfortunately, he missed most of last year due to a back injury. So it's like, okay, the whole reason why I liked you being 220 is actually to avoid the back injury part of it. But um, his 2020, 
two season was really nice. Um, he was even getting some Heisman love like midway through the season. And then 2023, he tweaked his back in the first week of camp and he never really recovered from it. Missed the first game in the season. Played for three straight games. Right, and he was he was kind of good those games. And he was good. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. He was good. And then that I think BYU was the last game he played. He went to warm up for the Texas game, which was the game the next week. And he was like, I can't do this. Like, I'm in oh, way man. too much pain. And they basically shut him down for the season because of whatever he was dealing with. Now he's been through a full spring. Um, their head coach, Lance Leapod, uh, was he said that they put him through everything that they needed to in spring. So he seems to be pretty good. Um, background on this guy, three-star quarterback, committed to Kansas over Air Force, Army, Louisville, Syracuse. Started six games as a true freshman. Then he lost the starting job to, is it Jason Bean? I think it was Jason Bean in 2021. But then I feel like he's been around forever. Bean got hurt. Daniels got the job back. Started nine games that 2022 season was good. And then obviously he had the back injury that he was kind of dealing with. Some strength and weaknesses with Jaden or with Jalen Daniels. Elusive athlete, really good escape ability and RPO ability. I think he can operate RPO offices really, really well. Arm strength is adequate for the NFL level despite the size. Normally when you get guys who are six feet tall, you're worried about just the overall arm strength. It's just less muscle to be able to grip the ball and throw the ball far. He actually has pretty good velocity on a lot of his throws. Now, the throwing motion is elongated, and because of that, sometimes you get a little bit of accuracy and consistency just because whenever you have, just for everybody out there, when you have a longer looping throwing motion, that is simply more things that can go wrong. When you have a compact ball is high, ball is back, ball is out kind of a throwing motion, less things that can go wrong less variance, a lot more repeatability in your throat. So when you hold the ball lower and when you, you know, Tebow is, you know, the famous one for this, when you pat the ball and it's just this Ferris wheel of a, of a, of a throwing motion, well, then a lot of things can go wrong. So he's not Tim Tebow levels, but he's got a little bit of a loop. And sometimes that goes in the overall accuracy, but he has some really impressive touch passes, especially on the run. Some of these guys have mobility and they're scramblers. But when they pass on the run, it's all over the place. Jalen's scrambling grade was 75.3, really high. One of the highest marks of any quarterback in the class. His adjusted completion percentage on scrambling throws, 74.1. So this is a true outside the pocket, outside of structure type of a quarterback. He's also willing to look over the middle of the field through his progressions. I've seen him manipulate defenders with his eyes as well. So he, you could tell that he understands defense is pre-snap um the issue with him now the the, the time to throw 3.09 seconds so it's over three seconds he is another one of those players that just has to balance out the superman plays versus the hey just throw it out of bounds live to fight another down type of a thing but i really hope we get a fully healthy year from jalen daniels because his 2022 tape he had some really special moments especially that duke game that duke game was fantastic if he was playing with a hurt back last year in those three games that we saw, that's unbelievably yeah, impressive what impressive. he was still able to do. Hope we get a fully healthy year from him because, dude, he was so much fun to watch. That's an interesting one. I'm really looking forward to watching him now, going back to 2022. So this should be his fifth year, correct? Because he was in yes. the 2020 recruiting class. So that would be one, two, three, four, five. Yes, he's a redshirt senior. Redshirt yep. senior. Okay, so he'll yeah, full process for him. I was gonna say, I just feel like he's been on the map for a he long has. time because he played a lot of games as a freshman. Like you said, he started six games as a freshman. Yep. So yep. okay, well, Jalen Daniels, I'm definitely interested to honestly watch him out of the gate because, like you said, that you can't like the fact that he was fighting through a back injury that just limits limits every aspect of your game as a quarterback. Dude, he. I, I was reading an article. After they shut him down after the Texas game, I think he said that like his mom and his sister had to like fly to campus to stay with him for the next like month because he, barely, for him? he yeah. could barely get out of bed. Yeah. And this guy was playing <laughs> D1 football games. So, all right. So who do you, who do you got at number four? Connor Wigman from Texas A&M. Nice. nice. Is he in your top five? He is in my top five. Okay. I he like where you're going five. with this. He is in my top five. I think he's my favorite quarterback in the class. 
And that doesn't mean the, you know, obviously he's not number one. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of projecting to do here. You want to talk about players that missed a lot of last season, similar to your Jalen Daniels theory, you know, thought process there. Mm -hmm. Wigman, his 2023 season ended after four starts due to a foot injury that ended his season. In those four starts, eight touchdowns, two picks really weren't his fault. The two picks when you watch them, at least one of them definitely wasn't. Five big time throws. Former four star recruit. He was rivals in ESPN's top quarterback in his recruiting class. Highly touted baseball prospect out of the state of Texas. Yep. This guy really, really can throw the absolute hell out of the football. And it's, it's, I'm trying to find the right word. It's graceful. It's not like, I'm big and now I'm winding up and I'm going to roll out and just chuck it 80 yards. Legitimate quarterbacking. I mean, big time arm drives the ball outside. It's how I felt about Penix in a way where you watch Penix drop back and it's like, okay, he understands what to do with his feet, how to kind of shift the pocket and drive the ball in between coverages. And this is a really young player. Mm -hmm. I love watching him throw. Now, I do think there's a little bit of a delay in his motion about it's it's kind of odd. It's like halfway through. It's not a deal breaker for me. But it's definitely something I want to see speed up this year. Yeah. Right? Did you catch that too? It's a little bit he, his his whole motion is is kind of baseball-y. Yes. Like it's kind Which of okay. the baseball backgrounds right there. You you could see it in how he throws a football. Very game. shortstop-esque. Yes. Um so listen, he's a fearless player. You watch him run, he'll lower his shoulder to finish plays, the chains are in the end zone. He was a machine on third downs. So if you want to see a young quarterback dominate on third downs with decisiveness and confidence mm -hmm. and talent. Mm -hmm. I, if this guy doesn't get hurt, I don't know what AM season looks like. I he's I'm buying in. If I'm buying in on anybody in this class to end up with a first round grade besides my number one quarterback, it's Connor Wigman. Like all the talent is there and a lot of things you can't teach. And I think he's tough as hell. And I think he just sees the field in a way that I, I didn't really see a lot of these guys come up to that level. And I understand I'm, I'm looking at small sample size, four games, you know, he is season ends during the Auburn game. I get it. But sometimes you just watch and you're like, yep, yeah, I'll bet on it. And I hope it works out because this is the kind of player that this quarterback class needs. It is very interesting that you say that if you could see a guy ascending to first round status, it would be Connor Wegman uh, because he is QB one for me. Wow. I get, listen, like it's a big balls move by you because the sample <laughs> size is just it's just there's not a lot. It is. It but is. I, it is. It's like if and there'll be people that be like, what? <laughs> I listen. No, I'm I totally get it. I think I like his tools mm -hmm. way better than my I'll just say it. My third quarterback, Shadur Sanders, and my second quarterback, Quinn Ewers. Like I, I like his tools way better. I just need him to see him play football. Wait, like I. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. 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 That means you have. Yeah. That means you have Carson at one. Okay. okay. Yeah. I have Carson. I was, at about, one. To, like, I was about to lose my shit because I thought you didn't have him in Carson your top at ten. All? I was like, why? why we got to start the podcast over. We got to do just an no. hour on that alone. No. Okay. Yeah. So uh, look, I'm I'm with you 100. percent He's my QB one. I'll talk about him now. Um. Now you mentioned it. He only played four games last year because of a foot injury, broke a bone in his foot. Uh, and those teams that he played in 2024, New Mexico, Miami, Louisiana, Monroe, and then he played some, some of that Auburn. game before yeah. getting hurt. And so it's like, is the competition level great? No, but you saw so much of what you already wanted to see from him. You mentioned it really great on third down, 87.9 grade on third and long alone. Past the sticks number on third and long, 64.3%. This guy is going to get the first down with his arm. His passes over the middle of the field, okay, intermediate middle of the field, 10 to 20 yards down the field in between the numbers, 92.5 passing grade. Clean pocket passing grade, elite. Standard dropbacks, elite. Early down, so first and second down as a passer, elite. No play action, elite. Under pressure, 86.5. His grade as a scrambler, 71.6. His time to throw, 2.56. This guy's decisive. He's getting the ball out of his hands quick, despite it really being, you know, not ha having many games under his belt as a starter. Avoiding negatives, 98th percentile 
Sack rate taken 88th percentile. He is a natural athlete. He is a natural mover. You could tell he's got that multi-sport background. He's got impressive touch on those deep passes. I think that his style, his scheme, and his ceiling is very scheme versatile. He's not somebody who you go, okay, yeah, he's got to just play in a vertical offense, or he's got to play in an RPO offense, or it's got to be a West Coast offense. He can do it all, I think. I, I think agree. I think yeah. what he can do is very scheme versatile going to the next level. A little bit of weaknesses. The follow-through can have that wide leg kick. I mentioned the ba- the baseball background. Sometimes he fades away. He he does like kind of what Bo Nix did a little bit too much last year where he's just fading away from passes where you don't really need to step into it a little bit more, be a little bit more confident. The distance on passes, not as impressive as that velocity is, but it might be because of the shorter throwing motion. Like you mentioned, he's got that shorter kind of like shortstop sort of throwing motion to him. So I wonder if maybe if you free his mind to stretch that out a little bit more. Maybe you get a little bit more distance on it. Cause I do think that he has the arm strength. Um, and then the, the other one, and this is, this is the biggest question mark with him. He appeared rattled in that Auburn game of the games that he played last season. The one worse. that meant the most was the one where he looked the most rattled. Now you can take that and you say, see, that's the real Connor Wegman. Or you can say, no, no, no. That was, you know, he he could, he, you can't really hold that too much against him because he didn't even get time to recalibrate and have that great second half and really kind of turn things around before he got hurt. So I, I think that the flashes of what this guy shows is fantastic. My early player comp from him, and this is sort of a throwing motion comp and a little bit of just like a style comp. I think he is a more mobile and more natural Mac Jones because think about Mac. Mac is an excellent passer. I think he is an excellent passer. Where Mac falls short is when you when you force him off his spot, when you make him be mobile, and when you make him be sort of like a natural athlete outside of structure and under pressure. Wegman does those things well. So that's why I say he's a more natural, a more mobile Mac Jones because you're taking the best of what Mac was as a passer that made him a first-round pick, and then you're kind of taking away a lot of the deficiencies with Wegman being a much better athlete. So I think people might hear that comp and they'd be like, whoa, Mac Jones, he stinks. Mac was still a first round pick based off of how good of a passer he was. And I think if you add some athleticism in there, it changes and really elevates kind of who he is as an overall prospect. And I feel like that's how I see Wegman. So um, I got Wegman as QB1. I I love it. I didn't even know if you'd have him on your list. I was like, when I put him at four, I was like, man, I I think people are going to freak out when I do this. But my four, you're going to hate. Okay. Who do you think it is? Well, if he's not in my top 10. No, he's not. And it's not Aller. It's Graham Mertz. It is Graham Mertz. Yeah. Hey, yeah. made a lot of strides last year. I need to see more. Listen, I am. I graduated from the University of Florida. All right, there. I'm getting it out of the way. I did not have very high expectations about Graham Mertz at all going into last season. And I'm really not trying to be a homer at all whatsoever about Mertz because I'm going to be honest. I went into this film review thinking that I would just see somebody who is, I don't know, very um, mid, for lack right. of better words. And he really impressed me in a lot of areas. Six foot three, 215 pounds. It's 55th percentile, 29th percentile for Graham Mertz, former four star quarterback. Um, he was the Gatorade Kansas football player of the year as a senior in 2018. He uh, committed to Wisconsin, played at Wisconsin, lost the initial quarterback battle in 2019, but then he started for the following three seasons at Wisconsin before transferring over to Florida. His numbers last year were so much better in almost every single area than they ever were at Wisconsin. I'm talking about passing grade, passing efficiency. The turnover-worthy play percentage was low. Uh, The sack percentage was much lower. Um, Actually, no, the avoiding negatives was much lower. Uh, The big-time throw rate was a little bit higher. Like Everything was just so much better for Graham Mertz. Just played smarter football to me. Dude, Even if it was vanilla at times. Yes, yes. Now, the average depth of target was a little bit lower. The big-time throw percentage yeah. a little bit lower. So there's no doubt about it. He's got he's to push the ball a little bit deeper down the field. But, I mean, the guy was great on third and long. He was great over the middle of the field. He was such a smart player. Here's some strength and weaknesses that I had for him. Fundamentally sound passer from his footwork to his release. Very repeatable almost every single throw. Experienced player who understands pre-snap and progressions and timing. Th- that is what impressed me the most with him versus the rest of this class. There were so many other quarterbacks that I've looked at and I watched in this class where I went, you, you, there is there's so much that is still needed on a play-by-play basis for honestly how you see the field pre-snap 
to be able to either speed up your timing or or get your eyes to the right spot or make the right decision. Graham Mertz was able to see things in the pre-snap to not only get the ball out of his hands when he needed to, 2.68 time to throw, but also manipulate defenses with his eyes and find where the space was going to be before it really opened up. Not afraid to look and attack the middle of the field. Adequate arm strength for the pro level. Um, high passing grades on the run and under pressure as well. Under pressure grade, 91.0, Connor. This guy this guy just didn't make mistakes when he was pressured. He was very, very safe. Like, just safe. It yes. Felt. Yes. That's Never. okay. He, need, he honestly needed a year of that. He 100%, really did. 100%. Weaknesses for him. Accuracy dips when the touch was required, which I, you know, it needs to be a little bit better next year. 2023, by far his most efficient season and must continue, as you mentioned when I brought his name up initially. But my scouting summary for him to kind of wrap it up here, Mertz had his best season in 2023. Though his big-time throw percentage and average depth of target were low, he was smart, accurate, avoided negatives very well, including under pressure and on the run. He's got an adequate NFL arm and must improve that in 2023, his season was not an outlier in how efficient he was while pushing the ball down the field a little bit more. If he continues to improve, he's going to have a lot of fans in NFL front offices, I think. Early comp for him is uh, is Kirk Cousins. That's kind of how the, the archetype of kind of like what I saw he could become at the NFL level and where he's going to have success. It's going to look like what Kirk Cousins has had over the last couple of years. So we both had Shadir at QB3, it seems like. Uh, yeah, or, we did okay. indeed. Okay, okay. All right, so you have you have Carson Beck at QB two. I have him QB one. Yep. Um, this show is officially the official show of Connor Wigman, quite clearly. All right, Shadir Sanders. I mean, man, what an interesting prospect to discuss. And here's what I mean by that: I think Shadir has had such a wild ride. He was a four star recruit. He was number sixty on the ESPN top three hundred. Like Shadir was a legit recruit, and he goes to Jackson State with his dad. He obviously plays very well against that level of competition. Now he's obviously with Colorado power five. I think he came out of the gate hot. They obviously did not have the second half of the season that they were hoping. There is so much, you know, loud noise around Shadur, whether he's playing good or bad because of everything Dion's doing at the Colorado program, mm -hmm. sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. As a player, like let's just talk about Shadir the player because I think that is so often misguided. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is somebody that when all the betting uh, books launched their number one pick odds, he was the number one guy. Right. And I'll be honest with you, as an NFL draft analyst that's watched now a lot of Shadir Sanders, I, my jaw hit the floor to think of Shadir Sanders as the favorite to be the number one overall pick in next year's draft. And I yeah. don't even think that's a knock on Shadir Sanders. I just think that it's just misguided of what he is now. And then there's some people that are too harsh on him. So here's what I thought of him as a player. Finished 2023 with their over 3,200 passing yards, 27 passing touchdowns, only three picks, 22 big time throws and seven turnover worthy plays. He added 379 rushing yards, four touchdowns, good numbers all around. I think he ties his lower half to his eyes when given time in the pocket, like mechanically when things are right. And this line wasn't very good when mechanically, cool. Yeah, this line was bad. Now, you're me, way too nice there saying yeah. that. Well, I do want to get into that, and I will with the weaknesses. Cheeks. Certified. When he has time, like mechanically, it's pretty to watch. I think he's got a snappy throwing motion, and Shadur understands when it needs to be tight, and I think that's really, really impressive. How to tighten the motion depending on the kind of play, whether it's the drop, whether it's the concept, and it could also be the pressure he's looking at. He is a very effective middle of the field thrower, short, intermediate, deep, 35 for 50 in the 10 to 19 yard range while averaging 11 yards per attempt. Throws a pretty catch and run ball when targets are working on crossing routes. He understands how to get his guys, uh, you know, in stride mm -hmm. to allow them to really be effective with their run after a catch ability. He looks to scramble into space to extend passing plays. He's not just like, oh, pressure's on, I got to run. He's trying to scramble and find a new area to set up his th like throwing motion for. And I think that's that's the sign of a, a quarterback that's played a lot of football, by the way, right? Like Jackson State starter right away. Now he's got to start at Colorado. He's played a lot of football, and that's somebody to me that there's some polish in his game. Uh, he throws the deep ball with touch when he's playing on time and in rhythm. Like it could be really, really pretty. Yep. Here's the weaknesses, and there's a lot of them. Jaw dropping 49 sacks in 2023. I get the offensive line sucked. He holds the ball forever. 
Yeah, forever. almost three, almost three seconds time to throw is two point eight nine for in an offense that that wasn't the idea of the offense at the beginning of last year. Yeah, so I, I think his arm is average at best. I don't think it's a great arm. And when you watch you. a class that has big arms, it really hits you. Like yep. I watched Jalen Milrow. I watched yep. Donovan Smith, Quinn Connor Harris. Wigman. It's yeah. like, whoa, OK, this is not that arm. Yep. It's not close. Uh, the, you saw a struggle with the adjustment of the speed of the front seven defenders in the power five. Like I, I maybe like Jackson said, it was just like, ah, I can make a lot of these guys miss or roll out of the pocket and run away from guys caught up to him. He is not this elite athlete. Like it's not like watching cam ward, right. Or even Milrow where it's they're out in space and you're like, oh man, like we could blend even like Riley Leonard. When you watch Riley Leonard, Leonard run in 2022, he makes people miss, and he's. Leg- I think he ran for almost 700 yards in 2022. Oh, Riley's got some skill. Riley can really, really run. That is yeah. not Shadur Sanders. No. Um, he's a take what's there runner once the pass the line of scrimmage. His running style sure remind me so much of Russell Wilson. So much of Russell Wilson. Hmm. Deep sideline throws are a work in progress to me. I-, I thought he was relatively inaccurate and lacking required velocity when he was thrown outside the numbers. Like, I filtered the 15 to 25 yard range throws outside the numbers. He was 0 for 12 and they just weren't particularly close. So, and that, like the NFL, you're going to drop back and throw outside the numbers in the 15 plus yard range. You're going to yeah. be asked to threaten that part of the defense. It, yeah. We don't have any sample size of him doing that last year. Yeah. Uh, he's fumbled 24 times in three seasons. And that's a case with a lot of these guys. Fumbling is an issue. It's an issue for him. Shadur to me right now is a day two prospect that I think does a lot of impressive things mechanically. Mm -hmm. And when he's given time in front of him, he understands how to operate the offense. Like you could tell he really buys into what the offense wanted to do when things were right. When things started to go wrong, it looked really, really bad. He So I like the number one overall pick projections to me are so far away. Saying that he's not a pro quarterback is so far away. He's just right. He's just right in the middle to me is this like top 75 ish top 50 ish like He's got a lot of work to do this year that could fluctuate which way that goes. Mm-hmm. But that's where I landed on Shadir Sanders and how he was my QB3. Yeah, look, I, I I see him very similarly to how you do, and he's QB3 for me as well. Um, I, I I hope that people like don't take this too um, out of control because there's just there's there's so much that can change. But like I gave him an early late second, early third round. Grade. I would be like, right there. Oh, 100% with you. That's the range. Now his, his style reminded me a lot of Teddy Bridgewater, actually very similar in size to Bridgewater. Um, my favorite trait of Bridgewater coming out of the draft was that Bridgewater had just ice in his veins, man. It felt like he was just taking hits after hit after hit. And he was continuing to throw the ball well and um, get it to where it needed to. But Bridgewater didn't necessarily have the best mobility. I think that that's still the case with Shadura Sanders, man. You mentioned all the sacks that he took. Okay, think of all the sacks that he took and all the fumbles. You mentioned the fumbles as well. Still 97th percentile in avoiding negatives. I mean, this guy just, he never put the ball in harm's way. He never hurt his team like that. And I think that there's absolutely something to that. So I think as a decision maker, really good. Yeah. I think, How does that factor in bad sacks, though? I think he took really bad sacks in no, the no, second no, no, half no. Of last year. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, and I guess, like, that goes into it, too. Like, bad sacks, if a sack is on the quarterback, that will count as a negative because okay. of the the avoiding negative percentile is any time he had an, a, was like a negative like play was recorded on him, you know? Yeah. And he put the ball as a passer in harm's way so little that even with the fumbles and the sacks taken, it was still 97th percentile in uh, in avoiding mistakes. So I think that there is something to that, and it's and it's worth him noting. Um, I the biggest issue with me with Sanders is the arm talent. I yep. just I just think it's 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 average to below average for the NFL standard. Yep. Um, I think he's got really nice zip on passes that are 25, 30 yards out. And if you ask him to throw past that, he can. Like, he's got the disc. Like, he understands. He's been playing the position long enough. He's got good enough fundamentals. He can crank his back a little bit further, and he can hit the right trajectory on the ball to get it decent ways down the field. But to me, like, go watch go watch Jalen Milrose release. Go watch J- Jaden Daniels release. And then go watch uh, Shadur Sanders release. Those guys are so twitched up. The, the second they want to throw, it is like, boom, the ball is just out of their like hands. snapping a rubber band. Right. 
And for Sanders, it's just not it's just not nearly as twitched up the the release speed is slower and therefore a lot of the miles per hour on the ball are going to be a lot less he just does not have that same level of velocity with him so he's a i think he, the, the timing can be excellent with him he can see the field really well he avoids the negatives he's great under pressure but i just i i, I just am worried about the overall ceiling with his arm talent at the nfl level he truly has to be a assassin like to me, so I, I I compared him to Teddy Bridgewater because I think just like size wise, he's the same as Bridgewater. They're basically built the same height and weight. Um, I think their you know their 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 combine results would be very similar, and I think their play styles are very similar. Honestly, with how much clutch plays and um, doing things well under pressure, like what Bridgewater was able to do at Louisville, um, what made him a back end of the first round type of a prospect. Like I see a lot of those things in Shador, but it, it, it's it's when you don't have that type of arm talent you have to be just an unreal assassin in your anticipation to make it at the NFL level. And so it's just, it's a tough ask to say, yes, that is Shadur Sanders 100%. And that's why I've got a little bit of worries about him, but yeah, that's where I've got him uh, on this list. So um, you want to go to Quinn next? Yeah, Quinn let's do first. Quinn and then we'll finish with Carson Beck. Yep. So Quinn ends up being uh, my second, my QB two here. He's I really, seven for me. I think him, I'd have him and Sanders graded the same, right? Okay. Like back at second round, top of round three. That's That might even be being polite. I'm more excited about the potential of Wigman, but you have to give Quinn credit for what how he's developed and what he showed last year, even with some shortcomings. Like I thought he really had a good command of Texas's offense. I think he operates that short horizontal passing game and quickness on, you know, and he's on target with these catch and run throws. He looked really comfortable off play action where he gets moving and the timing seemed built in. He had 125.8 NFL passer rating in 2023 off play action. Like he was really, really comfortable off of that. I think he has lateral agility and twitch in the pocket to create space Mm -hmm. where Quinn needs to take his next step to be this second round pick is he needs to get bigger, more mass on his frame the mechanics are unconventional that can lead to to off target placement. When he follows through, he opens up his entire front side and the arm starts to angle differently. Mm -hmm. And, and that can lead to his misses and seven passes batted down at the line of scrimmage because of that throwing style. He throws low sometimes and passes get knocked down. I thought there was added hang time on passes down the field that allowed some defenders to recover he can miss defenders in in zone coverage in the middle of the field and lead to some scary takeaways or should be takeaways. And the same thing you said about Jackson Dart, I wrote down for Quinn Ewers. There are clear predetermined throws on tape, no matter yeah. what the coverage dictates, no matter what the coverage dictates. So he's like, he's not your prototypical QB two in a class for me because I don't, I think with his funky mechanics and his lack of consistent downfield throwing, it's hard to say Quinn Ewers to me will be this round one quarterback unless he takes really big strides this year. And he is a young player, so he could. But I think what stood out to me, Trevor, is that he really had a mental grasp on this offense. And he is a he's not the biggest quarterback, but he's not small, where you can see things be compact and quick and twitchy and the foot speed. So I, I really like the strides he took. And I'm not even, I'm once again, like I'm not this big Quinn Ewers guy, but I came away from the film being like, you know what? It was a little better than I thought. Quinn's an enigma, man. And that's why I got him at QB7 because I, I don't really know what to do with him. He he might have the best arm in the class. He's got a crazy arm. I remember going to a um, high school quarterback camp when he was, before he went to Ohio State. And I remember it this, it was a Steve Clarkson quarterback camp. And at that camp was Sam Howell. It was DJ Uyunglele. Um, I think Bryce Young was there. And none of those guys who were in college were necessarily like throwing in the camp. But, you know, th- they were, they, they throw after practice or they throw after some of the drills or whatever. I, Quinn might have had the best arm of all of them. I think DJ Uyunglele is probably the only one who had a better arm than him. And this was yeah. when he was 17. And like Sam Howell was entering his like. And Sam has a good arm. Second or third year at UNC. And Quinn, it's, I, I almost just wonder if like he was really bored before he got to Texas. Like he's so much more talented than everybody that he would have went up against in high school. I just wonder if he developed all of these weird habits of just being like, 
Yeah, I don't need to set my feet. Yeah, I don't need to throw in motion. It looks I'm like just, a trick shot thrower. Boom. Yeah, he looks like a dude perfect. Like, yes, 100. I, dude, I completely agree. And honestly, he gets away with it way more than he should. He, and, and that's because his arm is so great. And that's why he's going to be such a tough player to kick. Now, you mentioned a lot of the, the shortcomings from him. Obviously, you see a lot of, I mean, some of the touch throws that he has are brilliant. And some of the backyard just play style that he has is is great. His his playoff of play action is really nice. As play when he doesn't have play action, it's not great. It's only a 70.9 PFF grade when he doesn't have play action. So that's something that needs to get better. But overall, I think the, the my biggest issue with Ewers is I have yet to see him play with true confidence outside of that Alabama game. Was it last year? Two years ago? When Xavier Worthy caught the, the deep ball? Yes. It must have been last year, right? Eh? Was it? He's yes. Yeah, because yes, right, yes, Bryce Young played at Texas. So it was last year. Outside of that Bama game this past year, I have yet to see a game where he was like truly confident. There's way too much hesitation in his game. He's hesitant about how he saw the defense pre-snap. He's hesitant about which wide receiver he needs to go to at what time. And you can tell that there are some times where he's on a primary read. He realizes that guy's not open. He sees the secondary read, and it's like he realizes, oh, shit. He, like, he was open. Like, that was like, I just had now to what? a little soon. And then he goes, well, now what? And, and either it's like a crazy throw or he's trying to escape the pocket or something. He's got to play with more confidence. There's got to be so much less hesitation in his game in 2023. And if there is, man, obviously, like, he he has all the arm talent in the world. But there's also a lot of inconsistencies with Quinn. And I cannot help but wonder why Arch Manning didn't transfer. And I wonder <laughs> if it is because behind the scenes, there's a chance that Quinn's not even the starting quarterback midway through that season. I, I kind of had the opposite thought. I thought after the year Quinn was going to transfer. And it's not that he had a bad year at Texas. It's just the arch effect. Right, but he stayed is what I'm saying. And it, when when Quinn announced that he was going to stay, why didn't Arch leave? Be and, and I get it. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, he wanted to go to Texas, but you only get so many years in college football, even right. with the COVID year, even with the redshirt year. So I cannot help but think he doesn't transfer because there are people there that believe that Arch is going to start midway through the season. And I think if that's going to be the case, if that is really true, I'm not trying to speak it into existence. I'm just wondering, I'm thinking out loud, is it because there are inconsistencies that people maybe believe that Quinn is just naturally not going to get over? I don't know. Quinn so should have went back to Ohio State. I mean, <laughs> I'm serious. No been knock on Will Howard, but... Yeah, it would have been QB1 there. So uh, Quinn is just all over the place. Uh, people who are listening to this podcast, please let us know what you guys think of Quinn. I'm very curious what the chat thinks. Are you all in on him? Are you like, How yeah. can you be, though? They're, even me having QB2, I have man. cold feet. I know, but it's just it, the arm talent is that good. And I just yeah. want—I just wonder where people are. Sound off in the comment section. Your QB1, my QB2, Carson Beck from the University of Georgia. I think there's a chance that Carson Beck would have been a top 50 pick if he would have declared after me last too. year. Um, he certainly would have been like if, if, if Carson Beck's in this class, I wonder if Bo Nix goes 12, you know, mm, that's interesting. I, because not, not that I think that Carson Beck was better than Bo Nix. I think I would, have, I would have had Bo Nix ahead of Carson Beck, but if Beck's in this class, do the Broncos basically like trade back and take one of these guys later in the draft? Is it is a little bit later of a domino with these quarterbacks? So, uh, what did what did you think of Beck, who was a first year starter as a redshirt junior last year? He's actually sneaky, been around college football a while. I thought in a lot of good ways, he was it was kind of boring, right? He is sure like he played boring football, and that's okay. Almost four thousand passing yards, twenty four touchdowns, six picks, seventeen big time throws, eleven turnover worthy plays. He enrolled at UGA in, in January of 2020. Uh, Four-star recruit, but the number nine pro-style quarterback in his recruiting class. He was initially committed to Florida to play baseball as a pitcher, but even he said baseball got boring. <laughs> Listen, as a player, the ball effortlessly flies out of this guy's hand. He doesn't need a lot of space to get the ball out with velocity. The flash, There are flashes of throwing with anticipation and understanding when routes are going to initiate separation, and that really stood out to me and mattered to me. You, you can tell... He was coached by Todd Munkin for a couple of years there, right? And 
He's got enough mobility to roll out, and the ball doesn't lose any life when he's thrown on the run. He averaged 11.1 yards per attempt off play action and mechanically just looks very comfortable. I thought he was surgical on third down against Auburn, Kentucky, Ole Miss, and Tennessee. Like the pre-snap awareness, he knew exactly what to do on third. And it is beautiful to watch him just go to work on third down against those SEC teams. The weakness is the release isn't slow, but it's a bit funky, and he, he can fall into just being this upper body thrower. Um he was protected extremely well in 2023. Shocking, Georgia, who just Georgia. turns out first round tackles. <laughs> oh, like it's Georgia, nothing. good football players. Weird. Pressured on only 19% of his dropbacks. He should see some more adversity in 2024. Has been able to play a relatively safe brand of football because of the team he's on. Checkdowns mm-hmm. could use a change up every now and then. A little bit too much fastball on the checkdowns. I thought against Alabama, you saw the lack of special creating skills. When things got tighter and coverage got stickier. Yeah, and and the teams are gonna be like, okay, how high can we take Carson Beck if that's something that we just don't have in our back pocket with him? Right, right, yeah. So no, I, don't, I don't really see that with him. What, and he's the, still a good quarterback prospect, but he's just not this creator to me. So his comp for me, his early comp that I wrote down is Jared Goff. One hundred percent. That's the guy. That is it, the guy. You know, and I know that's a little taboo around these parts because Detroit Lions fans don't like me right now because I rank Goff 16th in the NFL going into the season. But I still like Goff, obviously. You know, I, I think you guys are going to yell at me and think that I don't. But there's a lot of similarities to how Carson Beck played last year to the success in the style and the prototype that Jared Goff is. You mentioned it. I mean, like, when things are clean for him, I mean, he is an excellent passer. Elite PFF grades in clean pocket, standard dropbacks, early early down passes, when there's no play action, when there was play action. He had an adjusted completion percentage above 80% on the year, which is great. Time to throw 2.93. That ball's getting out of his hands quick. Avoiding negatives, 97th percentile. Sack rate, 93rd percentile. Look at this dude go. Now, you look at where the deficiencies are, and they're exactly what you mentioned. Scramble grade. 37.4. It's not there. Play under pressure, 57.5. And I wrote that in just the film notes weaknesses as well. Gets happy, got happy feet and nerves early in the early parts of 2023. And then when he was pressured against some of the better teams at the ending part of the year. So that's into it. But hey, he's got a little sidearm quick release to him. He's light on his feet, uh, throws a tight controlled spiral, good zip in the middle of the field. Flashes really imp- impressive anticipation, especially as the year went on. Ability to throw with touch and feel consistently, which you love to see from the quarterback position. A lot of things to like from Carson Beck as a passer. Just can he be more of a creator? What is he like when things break down? And so to me, that's exactly what Jared Goff is, man. If you give Jared Goff kind of a, a, a clean pocket, a good situation, man, he will make magic happen for you. But if you force him to move, things get a little bit squirrely. So Jared Goff, obviously good use of squirrely. I a hyper successful quarterback right now in this league. And that is what I think of Carson Beck, man. I think Carson Beck now Goff. I don't know. I think Goff has a better arm than Carson Beck does. Bex is good though, but Beck does have a good arm. Now I, th- I thought his arm was, was mid when I was watching him initially. Like I was two games in, I was like, I think his arm's mid. And then I kept watching. I was like, all right, you're a little bit better than this. Maybe it was just, hey, the confidence later in the year, because I always try to watch games and progressions mid, uh, beginning of the year, middle of the year, and I try to you know fluctuate with, hey, a good game here, a bad game here, but I always try to make it in progression to see how much you grew throughout the season. I think he grew well and the confidence was there. Uh, so I'm really excited to see him this upcoming season. But there we go. Okay, that is the quarterback episode. Just to recap, I'll give you my top 10, and then Connor will give you his top 10. And number 10 for me was Arizona's Noah Fafita. Nine was Houston's Donovan Smith. Eight was Ole Miss Jackson Dart. Seven was Texas Quinn Ewers. Six, Jalen Milrow from Alabama. Five was Kansas's Jalen Daniels. Four was Florida's Graham Mertz. Shador Sanders from Colorado at number three. Carson Beck from Georgia at number two. And QB1, baby, Connor Wegman from Texas A&M at number one. Ten for me, Jalen Milrow, Alabama. Nine, Donovan Smith from out of Houston. Eight, Noah Fafita from Arizona. Seven, Jackson Dart, Ole Miss. Six, Riley Leonard, now at Notre Dame. Five, the wild man, Cam Ward, now at Miami. Four, Connor Wigman, Texas A&M. Three, Shadir Sanders, Colorado. Two, Quinn Ewers, Texas. One, Carson Beck out of Georgia.
We want to know what you guys think. As always, it's been so long since we have heard from you guys. We know you got quarterback takes. We know you guys are big college football fans as well as NFL draft fans. Let us know what you thought of these quarterbacks. It doesn't have to be all of them. If you got you know specific takes on one of these guys, sound off. We'd love to hear it. As always, we love reading as many comments as possible, responding to as many as possible. It's been a while, so we're trying to get in the comment section uh, extra oh, long. We'll be here dumpster for, diving. It's going to be the, fun for, for this episode. Uh, if you got early rankings for some of these quarterbacks, fire them off. Give us the list. We'd love to see it as well. I'd love for the fellow addicts to get into some conversations about these quarterbacks because it might not be as star-studded at the top yet but man it's deep a lot of opinions on a lot of these guys so let us know what you think uh best way to do that youtube comments youtube.com backslash at nfl stock exchange we are so close to thirty thousand subscribers um that would man our, our goal before the draft last year was twenty thousand by the draft and you guys absolutely blew that out of the water it's been so cool watching this community grow i'm excited to kind of continue that conversation and everything with you for this draft cycle and this summer specifically if you're audio only we still love you at tampa bay trey at connor j rogers on both instagram and twitter that's how you can hit us up get your opinions out there from listening to the show uh connor got anything else before we get out of here Happy to be back, man. Can't wait to see this series roll again for yet another year. Excited to get everyone else's thoughts as well. And I'm sure we'll move to a skill position group for next week. Yeah, we will uh, We will hopefully have a summer scouting episode for you every single week from now until the start of the season. So that's what we're going to be going for. Oh, and also, we'll hopefully have some bonus episodes here through, sprinkled in throughout the summer. If there's certain topics that you'd love to hear from us, like redrafts or just like anything we would love to hear hit us again like hit us up in the comments whether it's this episode or future episodes if you think of one we'll try to read them if we can make it happen we will make it happen i'm trevor sick but that is connor rogers thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the nfl stock exchange podcast see you guys next week